Welcome back. All right, so some news of the day for all you fine people for your Thursday, November 24th, or as the Americans are calling it, Thanksgiving. Uh, in Canada, it's just, it's another day of the week. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit about some stuff today. There's not a ton happening, but hey, this is a good time to just take a bit of a rest and, and discuss things that are being discussed, starting off with um, an article I saw today on how the Canucks player development issues are, are, are a problem. And they point to Pud Coles and they point to some of the defensemen. And, and this is not a new thing for the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, I've thought about doing a video uh, for years now on every Canucks prospect that's been either overhyped or it just hasn't worked out with. Uh, every team has this problem though. And the one thing is with Vancouver, you have Besser, you have Hughes, you have Horvat, you have Demko. These are all players the Canucks drafted and developed. So it's not as bad. The problem with Vancouver, and there's other teams that have this problem too, is finding those diamonds in the rough. One thing too, that I've taken issue with with the Vancouver Canucks is you look at guys like there's Chatfield in Carolina, there's Nick Dowd in Washington, there's Travis Boyd right now in Arizona. There are players that the Canucks have kind of given up on or shuffled on from, and it's felt like it's been relatively quickly, and they excel somewhere else. Gustav Forsling, another one. And I know other teams have passed on some of these players as well, but it's, it's something that has been a problem for the Canucks. So... I think the issue goes beyond player development. I think it comes to asset management as well. Um, and, and being able to see how, if a player's not performing very well, how to fix it rather than necessarily jett jettisoning the player. And it's felt like they've jettisoned players relatively quickly, uh, depending on which position they're in. It feels like the bottom six. Uh, and, and I understand too, those guys are kind of easier to replace. But it, it feels like these guys will go elsewhere and play well. Which is funny because as a Bruins fan, I've watched plenty of guys play really well in the bottom six for Boston and then struggle elsewhere. So Boston's got a setup where it really works to the player's strengths and I don't know that Vancouver has. So either either there's there's an issue when it comes to the way that they're, they're, they're managing their assets, getting the most out of said assets, or there's something else going on there. So... The idea that Vancouver's player development, well, hey, this is a problem. It's been a problem for a long time. But at the same time, it's further than that. And there are examples of success stories. They just, they need more of that, right? You look at Spencer Martin. He comes into the Vancouver organization. He's now the backup and he's a decent backup. They need more stories like that. They need guys to join the organization, have a good run and, and to really fit into what they're doing. And so for Vancouver, who are spinning their wheels right now in the standings, uh, part of it is definitely to do with issues around the team. And while everybody wants to blame certain players, uh, I, th I think it goes further than that. I really do. And it's something that Patrick Alvin's walked into, and he needs to be the one that's fixing it, or Jim Rutherford's the one fixing it. Um, can't really point your finger at Jim Benning for much longer here. There are some bad contracts on this team, absolutely, but they can't point the finger at Benning for much longer. Uh, good news for Avs fans. Uh, a, Rodriguez was seen after last night's game not limping. So, though he left during the game, it sounds like he isn't that bad off. Uh, Nachushkin also no longer using crutches. So, uh, that's good news. Means hopefully he's on the ice and he's getting closer to uh, coming back sooner rather than later. So, that's good news for the Avs who, of course, lost that game last night against Vancouver. Uh, Shane Wright. So there's been all the discussion about Shane Wright and oh, what they're doing with Shane Wright. Oh, this is wrong, wrong, wrong. But I obviously have stated repeatedly that, you know, Seattle's taking a different tactic with this and I'm not going to declare it a failure until we see what happens. And Wright himself seems to be okay with it. Now, again, you're a young player. You don't want to come out and say that the team that's managing you is managing you wrong. So he's not going to come out and say that, but he does have the right attitude. And what we've seen of him so far in the AHL, he's been good. And this, again, is an argument for, and I've talked about this over the last few years, I think there should be an exemption. I think there should be for the CHL agreement, right, where players of a certain age either play in the NHL or get they get demoted back to the OHL, WHL, QMHL, wherever they're from, right, QMJHL. Uh, but I, I think there, there should be wiggle room. I think a team should be allowed to have one exemption. Where they say, this guy we're keeping, but we're putting him in the American Hockey League. Just one per team, I don't think, would cripple the CHL to the extent that I think they would fight it. If that was the case, maybe you could work out a transfer agreement. We're going to keep Shane Wright, and as a result, we're going to give 
uh, a million dollars to the OHL for development of players. Something like that, right? So, I, and I think the way he's played so far in the AHL, he's looked good. Uh, apparently, when they sent him down, they told him he needed touches of the puck because he wasn't getting that in Seattle. Uh, and not to worry about points. There was also the discussion about the fact that he's been under a lot of pressure for a long time. Uh, before the draft, he was the guy, right? And he's been seen as the guy for years. And maybe that's causing him to not enjoy the game as much as he should. Maybe he's putting too much pressure on himself and he might be overthinking it, right? Uh, which definitely happens. We've seen that with players where it's like, just just shoot it. Just don't. You're overthinking it. You're taking too much time. And now the goalie's adjusted and you can't get that goal or the defense is adjusted. And suddenly you're turning the puck over and you, you don't look great doing it. So uh, hopefully Wright does very well with his AHL stint. I wanted to talk about statistical leaders in the NHL today. Because again, we're at American Thanksgiving. It's a good time to take a look. Who leads the league in goals? There's a three-way tie currently. Bo Horvat, Connor McDavid, and Nick Robertson. Uh, no, Jason Robertson. Sorry, Leafs fans, I got your heart. You're, you're, you go like, wait, really? No, no, he didn't get to 15 goals last night. Uh, he's got one so far this year, right? But yeah, Jason Robertson and their brothers, it's fine. Uh, so yeah, Jason Robertson tied for the league lead in goals. And it's really been amazing to watch Horvat with the 12 goals in his last 12 games. And Robertson's always a joy to watch for Dallas. And of course, McDavid is McDavid. And I think if he wants to score 80 goals in the season, he can. And I think he could. But uh, I, I do think that at some point, the, the goal scoring will kind of even out. And then we'll turn around in April and go, how did Ovechkin win the Rocket again? That's, that's where I think we end up. Uh, McKinnon leads the league in assists. 22 assists for Nathan McKinnon. He has been fantastic setting up goals this year for Colorado. Uh, Connor McDavid leads the league in points with 35, which not really a surprise. So he's got 19 assists. He's three behind McKinnon in that category. Uh, Makar leads the league in average ice time per game with 27 minutes and three seconds. Makar is an absolute beast on the ice. Uh, Olmark is leading in some very important statistical categories for goaltenders in the event that he wants to win himself a Vezina. He's got 13 wins. He's got a 1.90 goals against average. His save percentage 935, which is one point ahead of Sorokin. And Sorokin, I think, right now, if we were having a vote right now on the Vezina, I think Sorokin might win it. I think Olmark would be top three, but I, I think Sorokin would probably win it. That's just that's just my my opinion. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, he might have got snubbed last year, and, and that might lead to a bit more of a vote this year. But remember, the Vezina's voted on different. That's not like a a reporter's thing when it comes to who wins the Vesna. Who so leads in goaltenders with shutouts? Uh, he's very good at shutouts, three of them so far. So he's on pace for like 12 on the season if he keeps that up. And who so has been quite good for Detroit. He's been he's been quite the find. While Nadelkovich's numbers have been kind of mediocre, who so has been excellent. Uh, Beneers leads the rookies in points with 14. Not entirely surprised. Beneers had the advantage too, remember, of playing a handful of games last year at the end of the season and playing well. And it was a seamless fit for him. And now uh, this year, uh, the 14 points. Yeah, that's that's about right. He's playing quite well. Uh, Pinto leads, the goal, leads rookies in goals with eight. I believe he's only got two so far in the month of November though. Uh, so Pinto's fallen off a bit. And then the other problem Pinto now has is one of his teammates uh, is in the Calder conversation too. Now, Logan Thompson, for a rookie goaltender, he's been excellent for the Vegas Golden Knights. 11 wins, 2.30 goals against, 925 save percentage. All of those lead goaltenders uh, in terms of rookies. Stuart Skinner's right there, though. But I still think Logan Thompson has an excellent chance. So if I was to say who I think the top three right now would be in terms of the Calder, I would say Logan Thompson, Matty Beneers, and I would throw Jake Sanderson in there. Jake Sanderson and Kalen Addison, lead rookie defenseman, a goal, nine assists for 10 points. Sanderson has shown for Ottawa that he can fill in uh, in the absence of Thomas Shabbat, and he plays pretty well. Ottawa's had a really rough year, but that diamond in the rough has been Sanderson and his development. Addison, on the other hand, uh, got off to a very good start. Still, the 10 points is very good. And there's still discussion of whether or not he's going to end up being a healthy scratch in Minnesota because they have good depth on the blue line. That is one thing Minnesota has uh, that Ottawa doesn't have as much of and they're definitely looking to acquire. So we'll see what happens there. But uh, yeah, so I wanted to go through stats. 
And of course, what everybody's talking about today, I wanted to close on this. Uh, Borier Salming has passed at age 71. I think it is fantastic that the Toronto Maple Leafs brought him in, uh, that they had him there, uh, what, a week ago? And you could you could see that, you know, he, he wasn't able to speak. Uh, Daryl Sittler helped him raise his arm. Like, it was just, it was such an emotional moment. And then, you know, Toronto's had emotional moments with Salming, and it's been great. I've never done a Borier Salming video. I will, not yet, obviously. Uh, but I, I will do a video on Borier Salming. He was, uh, I want to say, one of the, the first Swedish players that I remember seeing play. Uh, that I, and I mean, he was he was the best of the the Swedes of the first group that came over. At least that's that's my belief. Uh, as European players came in, uh, they faced a lot of scrutiny. I do think that still to this date, there's times where a European player might get more criticism than a player born in North America. But yeah, Salming was an excellent player who wore this jersey with pride for a long time. Uh, it was weird to see him playing for Detroit at the end of his career, but. Yeah, Salming, it, it, I'm, I'm just glad that they had that send-off for him on Hall of Fame weekend. And uh, it, it, it is tough, right? Uh, 71 doesn't seem like it's that old. Uh, and, and my condolences to his family, to his friends, uh, to the Toronto Maple Leafs organization as well, who I am sure this is hitting them pretty hard too. Because Salming, from everything I've ever heard about him too, is that he's a great guy. So... There are Hall of Famers that you will hear uh, whispers about how they're not very nice people. They're not really great, great guys. Um, yeah, he's great on the ice, but but I never heard that with Salming. Not once. Uh, fantastic player, leader on the ice. Uh, shame he didn't win a Stanley Cup, but at the same time, he had an excellent career. And, it, you know, his his legend will continue on. So there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.